Welcome to HSC Economics Made Easy. This video is part of a series on microeconomic reform. Last lesson, we introduced labor market policies. We discussed the concepts of centralization and decentralization. The minimum wage is a centralized way of wage determination as it is legislated by the government. And today we're gonna to learn about the short-term versus long-term impacts of changing the minimum wage. Let's start with talking about why minimum wages exist in the first place. They aim to increase the wages of low-income workers, raise their living standards, and lessen income inequality. These can flow on into long-term benefits as these low-income earners would be able to better afford education and training, leading to improvements in productivity, standards of living, and lessen income inequality in the long term. Furthermore, lower-income earners have a higher propensity to consume, this means that they're more likely to spend each extra dollar that they earn. So increasing the minimum wage would lead to greater aggregate demand and short-term economic growth. Those are some of the arguments for raising the minimum wage. There is another side to it though, especially when we look at the long-term impacts. Let's start with analyzing the minimum wage using a labor market diagram. This is quantity of labor on the bottom axis and wage on the vertical axis. A minimum wage is a price floor. Because this often sits above the market equilibrium, the supply of labor will exceed the demand for labor. This means that there are more people looking for jobs than there are jobs available. In other words, an excessively high minimum wage can cause higher unemployment. This is because if businesses are forced to pay a higher wage to the workers without seeing an increase in productivity, the cost of labor per unit is increased. Eventually, they would respond by downsizing, shutting down the business altogether, or replacing workers with machines. All of these lead to a loss of jobs. Businesses could also respond by passing on the higher costs by increasing prices to consumers. Not only does this lead to cost push inflation, which erodes the purchasing power of wages, but it also means a loss of international competitiveness. This again causes Australian businesses to fail in the face of foreign competition and leads to unemployment. And when all of this unemployment and inflation happens, it mostly affects those with less bargaining power, which is unskilled teenagers or migrants. These already low income earners are the first to lose their jobs or have difficulty bargaining for a higher wage to keep up with inflation. Therefore, inequality worsens. Let's also look at how it affects the business sector. Higher cost of labor would mean that business owners have less profits. This means less incentive for entrepreneurship. Like why should I take the risk of starting a business when my workers get paid the same as me? With disincentivized entrepreneurship, the economy misses out on increased innovation and competition and all the other contributions that small businesses make. Yes, I said small businesses. While all businesses are affected by minimum wages, small businesses suffer the most because they're the least able to absorb the cost compared to large businesses. So the income inequality between small business owners and large businesses worsens. A lack of profitability also means that transnational corporations are less likely to operate in Australia, meaning less jobs, competition, consumer choice, and all the other benefits that come with that investment. When we did the topic of income inequality, I also highlighted that having wage differentials can be good for the economy. If everyone was paid the same wage, then why bother working extra hard or upskilling? With a fall in productivity and skills, the economy suffers lower aggregate supply and international competitiveness, lowering our economic output in the long term. And finally, I want to address the first benefit that I made about the minimum wage. I initially said that income inequality would be lessened by increasing the minimum wage. But it can also be argued that this is redundant in the long term. See, let's say that I get paid $30 an hour as a teacher, and suddenly the minimum wage is increased from $20 to being also $30. I'd be pretty unhappy. I went through four years of university and gained expertise, just to end up being the same as someone without any skills or experience? No way. I'm going to exercise my bargaining power and negotiate with my employer to increase my wages to match my skill set. Doctors, engineers, and other professions will also raise their incomes accordingly. So in the long term, we return back to the same level of inequality, but now at higher prices. And again, minimum wages would be raised to keep up with inflation, and the cycle happens all over again. These are some of the arguments for and against centralized wage determination systems, such as minimum wage or penalty rates. Obviously, using more decentralized methods would have the opposite effects. Leaving the minimum wage low or getting rid of penalty rates could mean greater income inequality. But the economy could also benefit from lower unemployment, inflation, greater productivity, international competitiveness, business growth, and all the other benefits foregone in a centralized wage determination system. Furthermore, just because it's more market-driven doesn't mean that lower income earners will always be worse off. In 2017, Australia's Fair Work Commission announced that they would phase out penalty rates in some industries. While this would help many small businesses cut labor costs in the weekends and holidays, 
Many large businesses actually announced that they would continue paying penalty rates. This comes to show that decentralization allows businesses and workers to negotiate a wage that reflects the interests and situations of each workplace. Small businesses who would otherwise not survive would offer lower wages, but larger businesses looking for more skillful workers can do so by offering a higher wage. Decentralization offers more flexible and market-driven outcomes, helping to achieve allocative efficiency. I hope that my explanations and examples have made it easier for you to understand centralized wage termination systems, as well as the arguments for and against them. In my next video, I'll be looking at a few more ways that the government can intervene in the labor market. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well as follow us on Facebook to make sure you don't miss that. If this video has helped you, please leave a like and comment as well as share this video too. And I look forward to continuing to make HSC Economics easy for you. See you next time.